Thank you. So as Carlo mentioned, I've been doing Skydog since number one. I am a nerd, if you can't read that. I prefer intellectual badass, it's a much nicer term. Uh, we talk every year about what I call the mostly hairless monkeys. That's you all, people. Um, I've done that every year. This year we decided to go a little deeper into something uh, uh, with regards to leadership that I've been asked for over and over and over. Um, so what, we're, what you're gonna hear from is not just me, but some youth that I've worked with over the years in scouting who actually have become leaders of their own right, and they're gonna give part of this presentation with me. Some youth, we got two yes. youths, two youths. I am a proud youth. That youth that's... without the H. That's a good question. <laughs> I told you, I they warned them. They have no idea where that's from. No, I'm pretty sure they don't. I warned them they would be heckled. And then, then they asked me what they should wear. Well, I, I'm just saying heckling is in hackers heckle everything. So, And then they asked me what they should wear, and I said, whatever you want. And Eli's first words were, great, I get to dress as a Jedi again. Any chance he can dress as a Jedi, this kid literally does. It's like his favorite thing. If it's he could true. wear that That's to school, true. he probably would. I'm homeschooled, I do. <laughs> He's kind of special. So as the, as the quote says, we're here to try and inspire you all for something that may seem completely unrealistic. And that's the idea that everyone in an organization can be a leader and that everyone in an organization should have leadership skills. And when we say that, we're talking about something in, that you do. Um, it's, it's nothing without other people. If you are inspiring other people, if you're helping them do things, you are a leader. It's not a title you wear. It is an action that you do. Part of that is to go about building a structure that allows people to have that skill set. And that's really what this talk is about. It's about the set of skills that leaders have and how that is different from, from um, different things. So the first thing is, what is leadership? What do you guys think that is? You Anyone? can you can raise your hands and answer. Wow, you're 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 really good at that. So <laughs> there's actually definition coming. You, you're pre-reading my slides, Carlo. So in business circles, leadership and management are often commingled. Um, I'm going to say that is absolutely not true. They are not the same thing. Um, you do have to have leadership skills to be a good manager. Um, you can have managers that don't have formal leadership skill. It depends on what they're managing. Um, a great example of this comes from American Sign Language. So the American Sign Language for management is like a horse on the reins. It's controlling something. Where American Sign Language for uh, leadership is helping someone along. One is much more friendly than the other. You know, being whipped is not a great thing. Um, and Depends. as is example by the drawing, you know, bosses will tend to lead from behind and whip their people, where leaders are down in the trenches and doing things with their people. And because Carlos pre-read my slides, management, the act of managing, the condition of supervising something, such as a business, and then leadership, the action, which I think is the key word there, the act of leading a group of people, of leading an organization, and the initiative in that action. You're taking initiative on it. Everyone's a leader. We should just start with that. I mean, honestly, whenever I'm making dinner with my mom, my mom's the leader of dinner. She's like, Reese, I need you to cut the onion. And I have no choice but to cut the onion. But she's still leading me to do that, which means everyone's a leader. And we all have potential to lead as well. If you get delegated to do something like, oh, say, mop the floors, and there's a lot of floors like this hotel then you're probably going to have help from everyone and you're going to help you're going to tell everyone what to do or help them do it which means you're leading so that brings up a question you got to think why is everybody actually a leader uh, is it some gene we all have is some of us just better at leading than others um, if everybody's a leader that can't really be the case i actually say everybody's a leader because the core foundation of leadership is the ability to inspire and influence others. And anybody can influence other people. And so by that foundation, you can, anybody can be a leader. The other part of that is you want to have a common vernacular or common language among the people in your organization. So they know why things are the way they are, how they run. So to that end, a leader has a set of tools. And that's really what the core of this presentation is going to be about, is an overview of these tools. We could spend an entire presentation on each one of these things. 
Um, but we're just there's actually a course that you do. Yeah, there's several courses that you can do that we're gonna talk about as well. Um, but we're gonna give you a little taste of each one of these and why they're important from a leadership perspective and how they could be really important to any organization that you might work in on your own. This is not a comprehensive list, by the way. This is just the list that we think is the core of stuff. To start it off, you have communication. Communication is vital. And the reason for that is you can't do anything without communication. Humans, as humans, we are bound to cooperating and collaborating with each other. And without communication, you can't do that. So communication is absolutely vital. Next slide. The, the communication model that we use a lot, that's actually this guy kind of came up with the idea originally. His name's Aristotle. He's some philosopher somewhere. I'm, I'm not really completely sure. Uh, and he came up with this model. We call it MASER. Stands for message, sender, receiver. I actually think it's a little bit backwards. It should be sender, message, receiver, because communication is based on a sender, someone sending a message, and that message is sent, and then you have a receiver at the other end. And each part has to work. You have to have a sender that knows how to communicate, that knows how to send a properly concise message. The message itself has to be well built and constructed, and then the receiving end has to be listening. Otherwise, communication has failed. Each one of these parts need to excel, otherwise your communication has failed. Listening to learn. In order to lead, you have to listen to people. Because let's say that Mr. Koenig really wanted some Chinese food. And I wanted to go to Mexican food. And so instead of just asking my fellow people what they wanted to eat, I just immediately started driving to Mexican food. That doesn't work very well because you don't know where your people want to go. And if you don't know where the people you're leading want to go, how are you supposed to get anywhere? So one of the skills we talk about here is what we call active listening. So when you're in a conversation with someone or you're in an interaction, like, I, like she mentioned, I might want Chinese food. Listening to that particular piece of information that's important and repeating it back to the person to confirm that message that Eli mentioned is a critical part of that. So any leader begins with, with that part of it. Vision. Vision is a great part because you have to have a vision in order to get anywhere. A vision is what your future success looks like. So Mr. Koenig wanted Chinese food. <laughs> that is a vision of his, but some Bigger visions would be JFK's vision or Martin Luther King's Jr.'s vision. Those are some visions that they had. They wanted greater things to happen and they worked towards that. Working towards that would be your mission. That's your goal. That's how you get there. And then your values are, they're what makes everyone come together. So I value Oh, I value cows, and he values cows too because he gets food from them. I value them because they're cute. But he values them because he gets food from them, and I value them because I like them, which means we come together in our valuing of cows. There's a good chance that your company has a set of values. Um, for us, the way we met is through scouting. So scouting has the scout law. They're the 12 things that we think are important for our organization. Every organization has them, and if you don't agree on them, you can't build vision and mission that achieve those things. There, if you don't have that common vernacular at your company, you might want to think about why you don't. Um, I've actually worked places where we had to build them within our own team because the company didn't have them. Because it, it gives you a framework amongst which the entire team knows what's going on and can communicate about things. Conflict management. I want to raise of hands, who here has been in a conflict? Any, any time in their life, ever. I see two people in the back, they haven't raised their hands. That's, I'm, prou I'm proud of you. I, I don't know Liars. if I'm proud of them or if I agree with, with Mr. Koenig. <laughs> I'm actually gonna take Mr. Koenig's point. That's, you're a liar. <laughs> they refuse to use my first name and I don't know why. It, it's out I, of habit, I used I'm it sorry. when I text him, but that's about it. <laughs> we'll teach you a few other things we thought. <laughs> I like this guy. So there's, 
there's an important <coughs> thing with conflict management because you can't let conflict necessarily get too far because otherwise it starts to break down teams. Uh, conflict in some regards is necessary and we'll, I'll talk more in depth about that later, but you can't let it get too far. There's, um, there's this model that we use in scouting that we teach and we call it EAR. And start the E stands for express, A stands for address, and R stands for resolve. And it's a model which with you try and facilitate a conflict between two parties and work on it. First thing you do is you get them to express their concerns with each other. Get them, you know, why why are you upset about this? You know, why are you so upset that Reese, why are you so upset that you ate Curtis the cow. Curtis stole your cookie? Why <laughs> Why are you so upset about I that? Still cookies. Was... It was chocolate too. I'm sorry. Ooh, that's a that's gotta hurt. First of getting your jeans moved, what happened? I ate her cookie. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is an O. Oh. So we'd we'd have Reese express her concerns. You now this is you stole my cookie. I don't appreciate this. And then you work towards addressing that problem. Uh, you as an outside party, what you have to do is you have to understand exactly what's actually going on on the outside. And you have to look at it objectively. You can't, you can't let your emotions get in the way. How, I think we can all understand you get your emotions in the way too much and really bad and annoying things happen on Facebook. Look, take, just browse Facebook one day and you'll know. Uh, you wanted a cookie too. That's true. <laughs> so you have to address... You have to get everybody to address the problem, and then you work towards resolving that issue. That's conflict management. Uh, go ahead. Conflict comes into also talking about diversity and inclusion. One important aspect about building a team and using leadership is that you have to have, you have to be able to include people. You can't just Let's say you start a project with your friend, you're both some really good programmers, and you start making an app or something, and all of a sudden you need a graphics designer. And both of you suck. That's, that's a case where your skills overlap too much, and you don't have the skills required in order to finish a project. Um, there's another case where you need to try and include everybody. If you've got a team and you've got the, a couple of people are always stepping up all the time to answer questions, to suggest ideas, then, well, what about the other people? The other people have ideas too, and they're probably very smart people, and they have ideas as well. They need to be included. It can't just be a couple of people that are presenting all these ideas, because then you've only got a few of your audience, your team, actually presenting and, and helping and your team is not functioning properly. This is obviously a hot button in, in, in question in our industry. Like, what, what about this diversity and inclusion thing? The reality is it doesn't have to be. Diversity and inclusion are very simple things. It's about having your own mindset to ask other people their opinions. It doesn't mean you have to do anything other than that. Um, if, you have, if you find yourself going to the same people over and over and over, there's a good chance that you might want to explore this further. Um, there's also a bunch of research that shows that diverse software teams actually produce better software. They produce software that meets the needs of a larger set, subset of the society. They, they, they also tend to work together as a team. Um, if you have someone who you know, is part of your team that doesn't come to things very often or isn't included in projects, that's a prime example of someone you might want to talk to. Like, hey, I don't see you raising your hand very often. Why is that? Maybe you can get them involved in something and get their viewpoint. They might have a great idea. Um, I like that. I, I use this concept actually pretty often. You know, you have those problems at work where people say this is unsolvable, and I call that the elephant problem. And I call it the elephant problem because if you ever seen the pictures of elephants in Thailand, you have this enormous elephant. There's a little tiny rope holding its leg. The elephant could snap that rope in a heartbeat, but because the elephant was tied up with that rope when it was a baby and it couldn't break it then, the elephant has it in its mind that it can never break that rope. If you have problems that people say can't be solved, there's a good chance they're elephant problems. They couldn't solve them, and so they've decided they're unsolvable problems. The reality is, is somebody else might have an idea that can solve that, and that could be revolutionary. Project planning. 
you you have your project you have to complete your project but before you can do that you have to know how to complete your project so that's what planning does the other thing planning does is it helps you break it down into what needs to be done so I can give some sort of job to Eli and I can also give some sort of job to Mr. Koenig that way we we delegate it out and no one gets overloaded with too much work which means no one's staying up until <laughs> 3 a.m. and that's that's the best result there and that just makes everything a lot easier especially tomorrow I'm sure you guys were how, raise hands who works on projects yeah who, who gets to plan out their project how often does the plan stay with the project <laughs> yeah I, the Marines have a great saying, no, no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. However, if you have a plan, you've at least spelled out where you want to go and how you might want to get there. And so when things go wrong, you at least have a place to come back to. So if you're running out without plans or breaking it down like Reese said, odds are you're, you're going to hurt yourself. So leading change is also part of this. And what I mean by that is there are times when we know things have to change. They are broken and we identify them. But people often don't want to change because they're comfortable with the status quo. Um, if you really want to know more about this, I actually gave this as a full talk a few years ago at Sky.com, and I would encourage you to go watch it. The key point here, though, is when you lead change, you have to find the positive aspects of what the outcome is going to be. You have to sell that to other people. And as a large part of they're going to be people who don't want to change, and you can't stop for them. You've got to keep going. If you know it's positive and you know it's going to be good for people, you're going to have to find a way to push through it. Um, those are a lot of the key points. Again, take the time to go watch Insanely Great that I gave a few years ago. Um, as we mentioned, these, these concepts can all be an hour in and of themselves, um, and we've already done that, so I'm not going to dig into it too far. Um, as far as coaching and mentoring go, this is one I get to use a lot, especially with these two, um, and that's actually how we met. So we mentioned that we're all scouts. Um, I, I led a program called National Youth Leadership Training. It is a six-day long course that youths take where they dig into all of these concepts. And my job as the adult leader of that is to coach the young people on how they deliver that course and to mentor them in the skills they need to do that. Those are somewhat different skills. Um, coaching is more direct, more hands-on. That's in a situation where you have someone who, who's trying to develop a new skill and you're an expert in it and you're guiding them along and, and gaining that mastery. Um, you're gonna do that as a leader because you can't do everything yourself. The mentoring comes in as a team or a person gets more advanced in their skill and they want your advice on things. That advice can often be about the subject that you coach them on or something else, but it will often also develop into a, another relationship. And honestly, mentoring is one of the most rewarding parts of my career. There, there's a few people who I've had the great joy of helping along in this career who just came to me and said, hey, I think what you do is cool. Can you, can you help me along? And every once in a while, I would just talk to them about what they were doing and give them a little advice and help encourage them in the right direction. And now several of them are actually either finished degrees or are working in the industry. And to me, that's the best thing I could have ever done. And I don't get paid a dime for it, but it's the favorite part of my job. So knowing yourself is a really good way to help you lead others. You have to assess what you're good at and what you're not good at. I'd say that I'm pretty decent at making fancy designs on these. I didn't do it this time, but I'm pretty decent at like putting all the nice pictures I made on. the slides. Yeah, he, he did a great job. They're black and white. I would have gone for like great purple or something. Great job. I would have gone for like purple or something. It's fine. But hey, <coughs> in order to lead others, you have to lead yourself. And in order to lead yourself, you have to assess yourself. And a great way to assess yourself is this thing we call SSE. Stop, start, continue. Or is it start, stop, continue? Same thing. But you, you use that in order to figure out what you need to start doing. So say I need to start practicing more. And then I need to stop saying um in my sentences. And I need to continue working on how I do my slides. Those are all things that are helping me assess myself. But another way to assess yourself is to like ask for feedback. Hey, how did I do on this? That's a really great way of doing it. 
you guys have probably seen these in the office. They're called 360 assessments, or you can get feedback in a number of ways. Um, I encourage if you want to grow in something, a, a 360 assessment is a great way. Find someone you trust who will get the feedback from people anonymously. Invite people to do that. There are tools that will do it for you as well. But the point is that it's anonymous. It can give you realistic feedback about your performance, and that can help you grow. And if you're not having a one-on-one -on -one with your manager and asking them what you're good at and what you're bad at, you're probably not going to advance in your career either. You've got to be able to take that difficult, hey, you're not doing so great at this, this is what we really want to see sorts of feedback. But at the same time, you don't want to take all negative. I mean, if you're leading someone, you want to make sure you're giving them um, the positive aspects. Hey, these are the things you're really good at and we want you to continue doing. Back to her, stop, start, continue model. Great leaders don't try to be perfect. Great leaders try to be themselves, and that's what makes them great because that means that you are you, and that means you know exactly what you're good at and how to help others get to where they need to be. So decision making and problem solving. This is something we do all the time. You know, someone has to at some point make a decision in order to go a certain direction. But how you go about doing that can vary. And there are a lot of ways to do it in a team when you're the leader. You can, you can make the decision yourself. But that goes against the things we've already talked about with communication and listening to others and the diversity and inclusion. So often at work, um, we just did a, pro a project planning thing where we had all of our projects. We needed to decide what were the uh, 18 things that were going to be the most important. We had like 45 projects. And we used what I called a multi-voting method. So we had a round of voting and everybody voted on a, a list of projects in a given area. And then the top you know, three of them went into the top three slots. And then we had a discussion about those, about which ones we really wanted in the top slot. And we repeated that over and over and over. That allowed the entire team to give feedback about the set of projects that we're going to do over the next year and what they thought were important. And they're the ones doing the work. And we have a rule where we say no one works on a project they don't want to work on. We won't assign you a project. We won't say you're going to have to do this thing. We might encourage you to do it if it's really important, but we're not going to force you. We want people to buy in because when they buy in, they're better at that. The problem solving part of this is, again, back to that encouraging. How do you get people to put their best ideas forward? There's lots of ways to solve problems. We've already heard about conflict resolution using the ear method, but we may also want to go through different sorts of exercises with our teams. These also turn out to be great team building exercises. You can play, <coughs> excuse me, you can play games that you know, build teams. Um, we have a great one at Scouts that we call Brown Sea Island. You take a tarp and you lay it on the floor and everybody has to stand on the tarp and flip it over without leaving the tarp. So if you can get six people to do that in your office, as fast as I can get teenagers to do it, I'll be surprised. They work together very well and they learn about problem solving and decision making in a fun way. Just to add on to that a little bit, that's something, all these concepts are something that teenagers even as young as 13 understand and a couple years later they even fully comprehend this this is this is not overly complicated stuff and it is extremely useful uh, one of my favorite things to uh, talking about team development is actually the multiple stages that a team goes through when you talk about development uh, there are four stages that they go through some of you may have heard of this starts off with forming and then they go to storming then norming and performing uh, the, there are some very key aspects for each of these stages and how you lead and how the team functions. In the forming stage, a team has just gotten together. Uh, usually they're very enthusiastic about a project, uh, but really everybody's skill level as a team is very low because you've all just met each other. You're still trying to integrate. You're still trying to learn the social hierarchy of where everybody is, what everybody's skills are, and that's your forming stage. Uh, after that, you go to storming. Uh, storming is where a lot of the storms can come in. That's where a lot of your conflict management and conflict resolution come in because that's often a stage where people are trying to figure out where they fit in a social hierarchy with each other or where their skills should be. And that usually leads to lots of conflict. Um, people can get very mad at each other, and that's because uh, the initial enthusiasm from the initial meetup has gone down. And so everybody's enthusiasm's a little bit low. Everybody recognizes that they now suck at what they do, and so that even attributes to it more. And so they get a little bit antsy, a little bit frustrated, 
And so you have to deal with that very carefully sometimes. But if you storm effectively, you go to norming, which is when everybody starts to realize that we're working together pretty well, we're starting to do things, we're starting to have our teamwork be effective, and then eventually you reach the performing stage when your team is just crisp and nice and get things done and everybody is enthusiastic and happy and the skill is really high and they work together well. So the edge method. There's, there's two different edge methods. There's the teaching edge and the leading edge. They're the same thing. That you have explain, demonstrate, guide, and enable. Explain is for your, I'm gonna compare it to your team, your stages of team development. Say you have a forming group. They're really excited, which is where you could take that excitement and do the more boring parts, such as saying, this is how you do something, and not actually doing it. When they're storming, they're really grumpy and moody and it's not much fun, but if you demonstrate and make it fun, it'll be more interesting to them, so they'll probably pay more attention. Guide is where they are likely in the stages of norming, so you can kind of step back a little bit. You're still there right over their so shoulder helping them out, but you're not really doing it for them anymore. And then enabling, you basically just step back completely and they are off and on their way doing whatever they need to be doing. But like I said, there's teaching and leading. So that's teaching them. Leading them is the same way. When you're a leader in one of your little, and your team, you first have to explain where you want to get to. Then you have to demonstrate it. You have to do all of these things in order to lead them, not just teach them. So these things obviously have an enormous effect on teams. Um, and I'm gonna let both Eli and Reese give a bit of an overview at this point. And we're gonna, we have one more concept and then I actually wanna have them give some more feedback to you all directly on how this works. And my point being like, if 13, 14 and 15 year olds can master these concepts, so can you and so can your organization. Um, the going back talking about the edge method, that is a model specifically for, it's, it's very useful as a guideline for what you do during the stages of team development, as, as Reese mentioned, and it has a great effectiveness. Um, there's, there's a good reason for trying to build teams. If you have a very large organization and you, very large company, lots of small teams, lots of management needs to be done, it's very important to have very functional teams and to have very good leaders because those small teams paint the bigger picture. They paint the little dots in the big picture of your organization's vision. You want to add to that? Uh, to me, what the, it, how it affects it is if you have a team that is storming, it's gonna affect the entire big picture. So if you use the edge method and end up getting them to performing, your all out big picture is actually going to be far greater. So there's one other concept I wanna add, and this wasn't in our toolbox. We call it servant leadership. It's a really important concept for any leader to have. And the reason for that is the best leaders are constantly looking for how they can serve the people underneath them. And when I say that, I'm talking about the set of skills that you use to help them be better. Um, one of the most rewarding things you can do is help someone become better at what they're doing. Um, I've had the great joy of being mentored by Red here at Skydog Con to become better at doing stuff on badges, which I'm really not that awesome at, but I find really fun. I played my first CTF here at Skydog Con a few years ago and actually won. Learning new things and then teaching them to other people is a lot of fun. That is servant leadership at its core. It's how you go about helping other people be better and thinking about their needs and not just your own. And if you want to be a great leader, you sort of have to think in that manner. Leadership is not, not necessarily, usually is not about just ordering people around, do this and do that. It is about how you get them to the places they want to go. We accept responsibility for those people when we become leaders. They are, they are expecting us to help them along. They are expecting us to protect them a lot of times from crap that flows from above. 
Great leaders take that crap from management on themselves and take responsibility. And that's how you get people to follow along. <laughs> All right, so we talked about national youth uh, leadership training, but there's another course that I've recently taken that's just above of that, and it's NAIL, and NAIL stands for National Advanced Youth Leadership Experience. So, yeah, that's a lot. And we went up to, we went down to um, New Mexico, and there's a huge scout camp there called Philmont, and you hike mountains and stuff there. It's a lot of fun. But one of the things we did is we got into groups of like eight people and we had, all we had were two crew guides which weren't actually there to really lead us, they were just guiding us. And we went out and we made camp and we were stuck with these eight people and we had to figure out how to work with these people and lead these people. One of the things that NYLT focuses on is making those crews work, but now we're focused on making the contingent work, which means there were eight of us, but there were like seven other groups that were eight of us, and all of us together were contingents. So all of that, we, we were set in this challenge where we had to figure out how to break open a big lockbox that had like tons and tons of locks around it. And Lock you, picking would have been helpful. <laughs> I'm not sure they would have allowed that, sadly. But... <laughs> You had to go geocaching and find the codes in order to get that. And when you opened it, you got root beer, which out there is really good. It's a lot better than it is here. I like it here too, but when you're used to water, it's good. But so we all had to go out and we had to work with other crews. And through MYLT, we figured out how to work with our own crew, but having been forced to work with other crews, made it a lot harder and someone from those crews where you figured out your leader, you figured out who your leader was in your crew, you had to find a new leader in the whole contingent, which was really difficult, but it ended up being the first crew that made it back the first time we went out. And we were successful, which was great. But the other thing is for when we went out, it was like everyone had a radio, and we were all radioing in what code you found. And there was this whole process that everyone had to take part in. And there was one person leading it, but he was delegating who went out and who went where. So what kind of effect has this had on you as a person, Eli? Well, leadership itself, uh, I learned the original concepts from scouting. I've, uh, I took my first NYLT course, my first leadership training course, and I took it back in 2013. And in the years since then, I've been quite obsessed with the ideas of leadership and leading teams, but it, does, it doesn't just apply to teams or learning how to be a good manager. It applies to yourself. Leading others can just as well be applied to yourself. Learning how to make a goal, a big vision, and learning how to plan the steps towards that vision is something you can use in day-to-day -day life. And it's something I'm using as I'm going into college and I'm trying to figure out what I want to do in life. It's, it's a very hard decision. And I've got to outline and got to uh, plan. And stuff's going to go wrong and it's not going to go to plan. But I've got a vision. And that'll help me to achieve that. It's had a absolute... Uh, really life-changing effect on me for since 2013, really. So you may be asking yourself, how do I do this now? The answer is, as they've already mentioned, there's sort of a training continuum here. There's an introductory course. In Scouts, we call this ILST, Introductory to Leadership Skills for Troops, or Introduction to Leadership Skills for tr Crews. Quite simply, they teach themselves the basics. They learn what every job is. They learn who's responsible for what. They learn some basic communication. They learn some basic rules of the road that they're all going to follow, and they come up with where they want to go. This literally takes about half of a day. It's not, not a hard thing, and you can do this in your own organizations as well. Um, the advanced part they've already mentioned is what we call NYLT, National Youth Leadership Training, and it's where I met both of them. Um, this is a week-long course, um, and I would encourage organizations that want to do this. The same sort of thing is, is something you might want to build. You can just push it out in pieces, but it's digging into each one of these concepts for at least an hour. 
and really learning it and then practicing it and applying it. It's not just going to a lecture, it's trying it out in, an, in, a, in another way. And then finally is what we call this application phase. And, and Reese has been in what we call NAIL, which she already explained. And that's where you take the skills and we actually put you in the field and you try it out. So if you wanted to build something like this and HR is being the normal butts that they are, you have to remember that your first job is to create other leaders. You might not need HR to do this. And I've seen organizations where we've done that. If you really see a need for leadership in yourself or in your organization, I encourage you to go out and find it. You can join the Boy Scouts for that matter. You know, we will give you this training for next to nothing. Um, there, are, there are several people I know in this room who are Scouts who have been through this training. Uh, I, for one of it, and I've led it and taught it, and it was absolutely life-changing to me. So if you want to build something like this in your org, think about that same training continuum. Hey, maybe I just want to have a quick introduction. Who is people? What are their jobs? You know, what do they do? What are their responsibilities? How are we going to work together? And then look for ways you can either build or get that secondary training. So all the stuff that we give in that Wood Badger, that NYLT, which is this big list of stuff, there are companies that give this training. So you can go out and get it anywhere. You don't necessarily have to become a scout, but I think it's a great way to give back to your community as well. And then the final part is finding a way to apply it. So if you're going to build a program like this, make sure that as you build it, that you're giving people the opportunity to apply it. Apply it. The other key concept that I haven't mentioned here is these courses are taught by people who took it previously. So when we're giving that introductory course, the older kids in the troop are teaching the new kids. When you go to NYLT, every one of the kids that is giving those presentations was a participant in a year or several years before because they come back year over year. And the same is true of NAIL. So these programs depend on people being able to get the skills and then apply them back to the organization in practice. So if you're going to build a program like this, that is a key concept to remember. Any final remarks? Oh, God, he's thinking. <laughs> it's a good thing I have a hat. You might see the steam otherwise. Um, the, the, I'll give you one second. Uh, the one really cool thing about leadership that I think is just wonderful is that it's a life skill that can be applied anywhere. You can apply it in your teams. You can uh, apply it if you're doing a project, if you're uh, doing a hobby, you're playing a video game and you want to beat the next boss or get to the next level. Uh, it's really something you can use anywhere and in every aspect of life. And it's so in that matter, it's a skill that you should learn. Really. All right, we had a question. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to repeat the question. So the question was, as you have one group teaching the next, do you see it evolving and changing over time? Yes, we, we definitely do. I'm a generation underneath Eli. Um, Mr. Koenig's probably the first generation we have here. And we've all of a, I think I've gotten the most advanced one because they, their generation came through and staffed and was like, okay, we need this here and this here. And especially when you have adults that do wood badge and then they come through and do NYLT, wood badge is the adult version of NYLT. And then they come through and help all the people who take NYLT. And so when you have the adults that do that, they definitely have a lot of ideas as well because they see the issues in their jobs and they're like, okay, so we know what's going wrong and we can help these youth understand what's going wrong as well, which means it's changed a lot from when it started. Yeah, so there's a syllabus that we all sort of adhere to, but we all add our own flavor to it. I look at it like a recipe. This says the, the topics we've got to cover. It gives us this background material. It gives us ideas for building our slides, but then we add the spices to it that make it interesting. So instead of just standing up and giving a presentation, a lot of times they wear costumes. They come up with a theme that means something to them. They use film clips as part of it. But that syllabus helps us stay within you know, a, a, what I call the box. There's a box. You can do whatever you want inside the box, as long as you stay within those boundaries. And if you're going to build a program like this, you want to think about that too, because otherwise you may evolve, you may evolve off the tracks and become something you don't want it to be. Um, the syllabus does change over time for that matter. We, we, we actually go every year and we reevaluate it. So the sorts of movies or clips that we use to explain things change over time, because a lot of the movies that meant, you know, made sense for my group, they've never seen. 
Um, so we've recently added things like the Avengers and movies that are, are more relevant to their age group to explain these concepts in mass media that they see to help reinforce the concept. So yeah, you do see an evolution, but at the same time, um, there is a sort of boundary as to how far out we go. Sadly, Star Wars wasn't added to that list. <laughs> Any other final questions? Or smart remarks. Or smart remarks, yeah. I got a few earlier. Or dumb remarks. Well, we'll be around for the rest of the con if you want to ask questions about any of this stuff. Thank you for your time, Skydog, and thanks for having me back. <laughs>